Good morning and welcome to Nature Watch. Nature Watch is sponsored by Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center at the corner of 12th Street and Millam Road. And now your host of Nature Watch, it's Gary Miller. Good morning, sir. Hey, wait a minute. I, I got to pot your mic up here. Okay, let's try uh, this again. Can you again. hear me now? Good morning. <laughs> Good oh, morning. Thank, thank you, Mr. Verizon. I appreciate yes. that. <laughs> I had to say that. Couldn't okay. resist. Oh, oh, man, this heat. We're for, almost through it, my friend. We're well, almost through it. First, first official Saturday of summer, though. Summer arrived officially at 4.51 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Thursday. So this is actually the first Saturday of summer, even though this whole last week felt like summer plus. <laughs> Well, you can go back to May, too. We had some highlights there, too. Yes, we so, did. Yeah. Yes, we did. Michigan weather, it, you know, it, every, there was an article that I saw um, that it seems that summers are arriving earlier. Now. Yes, they do seem to be. And, gee, I wonder why. And, and it seems like the summers stick around and fall stick around a lot longer every yeah. year, too. Yeah. So. You know, this last winter, it broke my heart for... Uh, uh, those in the skiing and snowmobiling industry, and even if you're trying to s- sell a snowplow or two, it's just, you know, oh, oof. Yeah. Uh, nature goes yeah. in cycles. So we may see, uh, you know, some, some winters of that were, we wish we had a little milder winters. So. We are overdue for a nasty one. Yes, we are. So, yes, we are. There you go. Okay, uh, let's cheer people up instead of bringing them down. Even though, <laughs> even though talking about winter does does bring you cooler temperatures. Well, so, so, so maybe some good news. Okay. We we're, we're should be getting at the end of the spongy moth larva feeding on trees and plants stage usually usually we say about the first of july that's just a little over a week away um and we're actually seeing you know, most of those those larvae have uh, gotten to the mature stage and so they've gone into to a pupation so they're going to end up turning into those moths and then those moths are going to start laying eggs so we'll have to start watching for those egg masses so we can clean them off uh, best thing that the, the michigan dnr mentioned uh, Try to, if you can see them, gently scrape them off uh, those surfaces, put them in some soapy water, and take care of them. So those egg masses that you can reach, uh, maybe we can knock that population down and help their cycle go, move a little faster to low populations. Yep, there you so, go. Um, and then though, even though we, we are seeing most of those spongy moth car, uh, caterpillars to getting at that full size, we're still hearing reports of people having them about half inch or a little longer. So because of the warm weather early, their, their season seems to have extended out again. Again, we can blame the weather. <laughs> okay. If you have questions for Gary, 382-4280, 877-382-4280, or you can text in your questions to 80373, and I'll read them to Gary. But we do have a trivia question. Don't text in for that. We want phone calls. Yes, 382-4280, yeah. first correct answer will score themselves a $20 gift card to Waddell's Nursery, Floral, Garden, and Bird Center. And I won't be answering the phones. Antonia will. woo Yes, we have somebody else in the studio yes, today. Yes, we it's do. Nice. Yes, we have, we have Antonia in Master Control. She's going to handle phones today. And your trivia question for a gift card, be ready to call, folks. So, actually, I'm doing a one-part question today. Yay. Gasp, gasp, gasp. No two-parter today. So um, actually, this uh, was triggered by Jean's phone call last week because she was asking about fireflies. Oh, okay. And why we're not seeing so many of them. And uh, so, so my question is, how many species of firefly are in Michigan? Oh. I'm looking for a number, and I'm not going to give you a range. <laughs> it, it, you, we need an exact number. I need an exact number. And uh, so if we get closer, we have a lot of guesses that are way out of whack here. We'll uh, maybe give some hints as we go, but... Uh, so I'm looking for the number of species of firefly that are in Michigan. I'm looking for a specific number. And I will tell you it's less than 100. So I'll give you a little hint. Okay. It, it, it's a, it, is it, Okay, um, less than 100. So if I was a betting man, I would, I would say it's a double-digit number. It is a double-digit okay, number. Okay, so, so we've got the spread from 10 to 99. Yes, yes. <laughs> there, 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 there's your clue, folks. 382-4280-877-382-4280. First correct answer, how many firefly species are in the state of Michigan? You'll get that gift card. Yes. So um, Gene, Gene was asking how come we're not seeing as many fireflies, and we can blame um, actually numerous things. They're not quite sure what all the effects are. And uh, they uh, were uh, saying that actually sometimes the uh, – Light pollution may be affecting them when they're mating. The, typically that light, when they're flashing that light, they're trying to attract a mate. So light pollution may be affecting them. Uh, just broad-spectrum insecticides 
And so if you're trying to kill off those grubs in your lawn, you affect the larvae because the larvae uh, reside in the soil. And, and they feed on, they're actually beneficial, they feed on slugs and snails and other soft-bodied uh, animals. So they're actually a very beneficial insect. Um, the, the adults, it depends on what species of firefly it is. They, they have a varied appetite. Some of them uh, eat pollen and nectar. Some of them don't feed at all. Some of them continue on their, mature, their uh, earlier years, and some of them are actually cannibalistic, and they attract other fl- uh, species of firefly and eat them. So it depends on the uh, particular species what they eat as adults. Yeah, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. Um, they're also saying that, that because they have not studied fireflies very closely as far as the larval stage, they're just not sure exactly what all effects are uh, affecting those uh, those larvae and then the numbers and knocking those numbers down. Part of it's loss of habitat, too. They like uh, darker areas, a lot of grassy areas, and they like uh, actually when they get to the adult stage, like some taller grass so they can uh, have some place to rest uh, during the daytime. And there are actually some species that are actually active during the day. They're called dark fireflies. <laughs> okay. Dark flies. Dark, dark fireflies. Dark yeah, fly. a little, little oxymoron there. Yeah. 382 4280 Janet is on the phone. Do you have a guess? I'm guessing 24 at least. Oh, you were right on the number. 20. First guess. Wow. At least? <laughs> yeah, 24 right on the number. <laughs> How about 24 is? Yeah, 24 is the number. Okay, Good guess. 24 is. There you Excellent. go. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations, Janet. You have won a $20 gift card to Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center. And if you want to hold on the line for just a moment, I'm going to send you back to Antonia, and she's going to get some information from you, okay? Okay, thank All right. you. Okay, hang on. So, so we've been seeing a lot. I've been seeing lots of fireflies out. This, this uh, warm weather really um, has helped them emerge from uh, that larval stage, and so I'm seeing lots of activity at nighttime now. So it's actually fun, though. That was a little bit warm this last week to try to sit out and watch those fireflies. But it's actually fun to watch them flashing all over. Right. So, and actually, I saw some other neat things this last week. Sort of an active week, even though despite the heat, I guess. Um, I actually saw an indigo bunting earlier in the week. I'm just down the road from my house. I see them a couple times every year about this time of year. I usually see the male fly across the road in front of me, and they nest somewhere. There's not very many of them around, but uh, they're nice to see that real bright blue. Um, had to wait for a mallard duck, in the, a male mallard duck in the road earlier in the week, too. Mm-hmm. He was sort of just gradually strolling across the road, and I had to slow down and he finally got off to the side of the road. So. Okay. Just off for a stroll, I think. <laughs> we do need to uh, take a break real quick, but I have a question for you. But l- let me lead in with this. Have you ever been harassed by a squirrel? Yes. <laughs> you, you, I think you know where I'm going with this. Yes, I do. Okay. Well, we're still going to hit it, and I'm going to ask you anyway. Nature Watch continues next right here on WKZO. Your phone call is here, 382-4280. Have you been hearing the buzz on bees and other pollinators lately? There is so much we can do to help their survival. And you can start by attending the pollinator party today from 10 till 2 at Waddell's Nursery Florist and Garden Center, where you can learn about how to plant to improve their health and numbers. See up close live butterflies and chrysalises and step into the screen tent and feed at least 10 different varieties of butterflies. Increasing the number of pollinator-friendly gardens will help revive their health. Plant expert Kay Landrum will present her Pollinator Preferred Perennials class at 11 o'clock, where you'll hear firsthand about the plants that attract bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, birds, and bats. This informative seminar is just $5. The Kalamazoo Bee Club will also be at Waddell's with their bee exhibit, plus honey and pollinator experts. Come join the fun at Waddell's Pollinator Party today from 10 till 2 on Texas Drive at the corner of Millam and 12th Street. 76 in Kalamazoo, 843 Nature Watch continues with Gary Miller, and we're talking for a second here. Um, I saw online um, a post from someone um, that said, if a squirrel comes up to you, literally, and tries to crawl up in your lap, what's going on with that? So sometimes it's the younger squirrels, and they have lost mom and dad, and they are actually trying to actually break break down their fear of humans and actually come to humans realizing humans can help them, they're usually looking for water, especially in this heat. 
And so it's not unusual. I saw that same post actually a couple times. Uh, yeah. And so they're actually, they, they get over that fear of humans and they uh, say, gosh, I need some help. So if you, if you have that happen, get, get them some water. That's usually the biggest thing. And that's, uh, they'd appreciate it. I might have a, a friend for life, so I might have to feed him the rest of the yeah. <laughs> there you, so I might there have you mess go. with some squirrel food. 382-4280. Good morning, Brian. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. I have a question for you. We had a barn swallow nest in our garage, and there were four babies in that nest for a couple of days. And one morning we got up, and all four of them were laying dead on the floor. Hmm. Okay. Any idea what could happen to that, why it happened? You should have said the nest was gone? No, the nest was there. The, the barn it's swallows. It's up in the rafters. It's a big mud nest. So and there the were nest four was still, up there. Yeah, so the nest was still up there. And then the next morning, they're all on the garage floor dead. Hmm, boy, I don't know what would cause that. Um, was it? Did you have your garage door open so they could go in and out at night? Yeah, yeah. Because that, that would, you know, extreme heat if they were locked in, I would say. But that, I would have no idea what would have caused that unless somebody, if they ate some uh, contaminated insects, because they eat a lot of insects, uh, and okay. they might have, you know, somebody might have been spraying or something that they ate some contaminated insects, especially a lot of mosquitoes. Um, yeah. I really don't know what would cause that. That's unusual for the entire nest to die, die off like that. Oh, uh, that's what we thought, too. I don't know if it was bird flu or some weird thing. Yeah, uh, there, that's a point. Is that possible? The bird flu? Since it since, it, since it, could it, be. It, it is such a prevalent thing right yeah, now. Yeah, actually, it could it could be the bird flu. Um, that's awful fast for it to act, but that could be the the case. Um, if the birds are still there, you might want to try to go on their DNR website. They have a, a reporting, uh, either the a DNR or the Department of Health and Human Services, and they have a yeah. spot to report that. And uh, they may want to have you if you have those birds are still available. Have, they may want to pick them up or uh, take a look at those and then analyze them, see if it is in fact the bird flu. Well, we already got rid of them, so <laughs> too late for them. Um, but yeah, that, that if anybody sees that, uh, contact the DNR because they may want to um, actually study those birds and see if that was actually the case. We're seeing more okay. and more of that bird flu. I did not really see many reports this last week of additional um, um, confirmation of bird <laughs> flu in um, especially dairy herds. So didn't see much of that this last week. Maybe the heat sort of driven it off. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, okay. But, you know, anybody who sees those birds like that, uh, that would be worthwhile contacting the DNR just to see uh, if they want to study those or not. Well, hopefully it never happens again, but if it does, we'll do that. So thank you for calling in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. We do appreciate it. 382-4280. And, man, I'll tell you what, when, when they issue the uh, heat advisories and the air quality alerts, I pay attention because I am apparently a sensitive individual. I've been struggling for the last few days. So if you hear me... Uh, if you hear me in the background acting like I'm dying, don't worry, I'm not. It's just yeah. so. So actually, it, yeah. actually, Andy's just sent me a text because he has he read some other things too. Oh. Um, so we may the other thing might might have affected those barn swallows might have been a predator bird of some sort, and um, they uh, you know they might have attacked. They might have gotten their nest was too close to another like a blue jay even or something, and they may have um, attacked them. And and that would be unusual for them to kill all of them, but they could. Um, the uh, you know, even hummingbirds will attack, uh, you know, larger birds like a Baltimore Oriole and uh, try to scare them off. Birds are territorial when they nest, so that could be a factor. I uh, see a little old hummingbird, you know, just like, hey, it's small, but I pack a punch. Yes, yes. <laughs> I can fly around you faster than you can fly. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty much right. Too. So, so uh, actually, a few other things I saw this week. Um, Thursday morning, I saw a red-tailed hawk just taking off from the ground. It had just caught a 13-line ground squirrel commonly known as a go gopher sometimes and i assumed it was probably taking it back to the nest probably had some young in the nest to feed and so actually a couple of times this week i saw a red tail hawk but that was that one i had a had a 13 lane ground squirrel in its talons so that was interesting to see and then thursday night when i'm going home from work i had two male baltimore orioles zip across the road in front of me and uh, i'm guessing that one of them got too close to the other one's nest and they were uh, being territorial in the one behind was chasing the first one away. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that orange and black was a definite flash of, uh, you can see, see the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah. So um, need, some neat events, actually a really neat event today. This is the, sort of the end of Pollinator Week. You talked about it last week, yeah. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is actually officially the last day of, of Pollinator Week. But we have the Pollinator event at Waddell's from 10 to 2 today. And uh, the uh, 
you know, if you're looking for something cool to do, the butterfly tent is inside the store, so it's not blazing hot in there. We didn't want to have the butterflies succumb to heat. And there's actually quite a few butterflies in that and moth in that butterfly tent uh, flying all over in there. And we limit the number of people in there to very carefully go in and out of the tent so we don't let them escape too soon. Mm-hmm. And we don't want them flying around the store. We actually want to release them out in the wild. And all sorts of native uh, butterfly and moth. And so it's fun to see those. There's also some other activities. Uh, looking for something cool to do and just sort of relax and, and maybe learn something. Uh, Kay Waddell Landrum has a seminar today at 11. It's a nominal fee of $5, and you can learn all about preferred pollinator preferred perennials. And so you can learn about some neat plants that would be for the pollinators, especially those adult pollinators. Oh, there you go. So in the air conditioning, you know, yes. what more could you yes. ask for in yeah. a really hot day? Yes, there you go. If your car has air, they have air. You yes. know, the only struggle might be just getting out of your car into the building, but uh, outside of that, you're good. 382-4280, or you can text to 80373-QUESTIONS for Gary. Yeah, and actually, some I was going to go over, highlight some of the species of butterfly and moth we have in the butterfly tent. There's actually quite a few. Okay. So, And I saw them flying around last night because we had a, the start of the pollinator event last night. But there's a monarch adult, a uh, painted lady, red admiral, and actually, I've seen a lot of red admirals out and around the nursery and around my yard this last week because they finally uh, have uh, become very active. Uh, there's a comma adult, cabbage white adult, uh, swallowtail, the buckeye, a question mark, a variegated fritillary, the Baltimore checker spot, eastern black swallowtail, morning cloak, and luna moth. And there's also some clouded and orange sulfur moths. Um, that Luna, there is one Luna moth in there that I saw. There might be another one, but I saw at least one last night. Those are always neat to see. Very unique look. Mm-hmm. That really pale, almost luminescent, green, light green. And uh, so have a chance to actually experience all those butterflies and uh, do some other fun activities, learn about some butterflies and, and moth. And uh, it's always fun to see them flying around. It seemed like the last several years our butterfly moth population has been down in numbers. And I think for several reasons. One, loss of habitat. So they've lost a lot of habitat. And probably the biggest thing is besides loss of habitat, we've had some mild winters. And I think sometimes those mild winters, the butterfly and moth that do not migrate, because most of them do not, they overwinter usually in a cocoon or chrysalis. And I think those warm winters have uh, sort of done them in. They haven't been able to survive all winter. And they may have been happened that they tend to emerge earlier than they should. And then it gets cold again. Or we've had other critters eat them over the winter. So, again, we can maybe blame the weather. So it's like we're always blaming the weather in well, Michigan. Well, well of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's you there. Know, yeah, it, it, the mild winter, yeah. It, you, we were talking about mosquitoes coming out earlier. Than, oh, yeah. Than I, saw, I saw mosquitoes in February this year. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So, uh, point taken right there. Could be the weather. But loss of habitat's a big one. And then, and then also, that's something to keep in mind. We all have to use those insecticides at some point or other just because some, some pest becomes very prevalent and bothering us uh, or plants. And so that's something we, we want to use those very sparingly and try to use something that's specific for that particular pest. Um, if you use a broad spectrum, it, it tends to affect more beneficial insects, including those butterfly and moth, than it does affect the the uh, detrimental insects. So that using that... Uh, Insecticide is uh, pesticides are very sparingly, and, and trying to do sp- specific ones really helps those beneficial insects. Uh, the uh, yeah, some little neat of, uh, trivia things about uh, some of the butterfly and moth. The morning cloaks like to play dead, so they can maybe call them the possum butterfly. Uh, they uh, sometimes play dead for up to twenty four hours. <laughs> so sort of interesting fact right, about them. Right. And they overwinter as adults, so it's sort of an unusual uh, factor, too. And uh, have usually have several generations during the summer. We have those native pawpaw trees here, and the Michigan banana is a common name. That's actually a host plant for the zebra swallowtail. Oh. And uh, so very, uh, it's a primary host plant, so something we can see uh, those zebra swallowtails quite frequently. Okay. So, um, Antonia uh, passes this along from a caller uh, Wants to uh, know about gypsy moths. He has some in his trees. Oh, yeah. There's a gypsy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth, now called spongy moth. And they're still seeing some of those in the trees. Uh, 
they eat everything. They seem like their preferred food is our oak trees. And they, they should, their cycle should be just about done. They do that one generation, uh, should be going to the moth stage fairly soon. Um, if you're still seeing a lot of younger caterpillars, so in that half inch to inch size, uh, you might want to uh, use uh, some tree wrap and actually put some sticky product. We've got a product that would also actually be put on there. It's like a really sticky molasses. And those uh, larvae, the caterpillars, climb up and down mm-hmm. and typically go up in the top of the trees during the day t- or during the, during the nighttime. And then during the daytime, they come down and hide in uh, vegetation and that. And so when they go back and forth, they get stuck to that. So that'll help maybe reduce that population some. Uh, if it's a smaller tree and they're, they're at that half inch or smaller size, you can actually spray them with a, a BT, which is a natural bacteria that they ingest it when they eat the leaves and uh, the bacteria eats them from the inside out. So a nice, nasty death form. So sort of deserved it. <laughs> they have too many spongy moth caterpillar around. Uh, they're bigger than that half inch. Uh, we have another product called Spinosad that you can spray on those trees. You have very mature trees, so it's hard. To, you can't get up to the top of those trees. So sometimes doing that wrap with the sticky product and maybe you can knock those populations down. We should be because there's actually a couple of fungal diseases affecting them. And that tends to wipe them out. And then we may not see big populations for a spongy moth caterpillar for maybe decades. So maybe mm-hmm. maybe we'll not. Uh, we should, I think we're on the decline now. So the next couple of years we should see less and less. Okay. Last call for phone calls here: three eight two four two eight zero eight seven seven three eight two four two eight zero. You can always text your question to eight zero three seven three. Yeah. So actually, last week I was talking about ticks. So I maybe I talked about ticks too long. Maybe tick some people off. So I thought I'd do a little light everybody's light up with the firefly talk today. Jim Jim's giving me a strange look. <laughs> Uh, oh my! Okay. So, 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 the, so the ticks last week I did not mention, or maybe I did, maybe I did, but didn't catch it myself. Um, ticks are actually arachnids, so they're in that same family as mites and spiders. Although the insecticide, as far as mosquito repellent, will have has DEET in those, that actually works with ticks, even though they're not an insect officially. And so that uh, is something to keep in mind. Um, if you look at those ticks closely, they have those eight legs. Oh. Typically of the arachnids. Well, we have, I have about a minute. June's on the phone. Good morning, oh. June. Oh, yes. Hi, good morning, young Hi, man. Hi, June. I would like to know, where are all the black squirrels? Where are the black squirrels? So the black, yeah. so the black squirrels are actually a variation of the, the fox squirrels. They're the same family. Um, you just have that... Uh, Genetic mutation of instead of having the brown fur, they have or grayish brown fur, they have black. And so you may have young squirrels in a fox squirrel family that some of them have the brown fur and some of them have black fur. And For real? So, so it varies, varies by, seems like localities and regions. Some regions tend to have more of the squirrels that have that genetic uh, marker that makes the, that fur black. And then sometimes the, the, they revert back to the black squirrels may have young that have brown fur. So it goes back and forth depending on what the dominant gene is for that fur color. You Typically it's brown, but occasionally that black comes through. So it's just like, so just like humans, rare. we have different color hair. So There you go. Are they pretty rare? <clears throat> Are they pretty rare? Um, yeah, it depends on where you're at. Some, some places have big populations of the, of the, the black-haired squirrels. Um, I know Battle Creek is a big area population. Um, Kalamazoo, in various areas of Kalamazoo, you see them. So it, it depends on, uh, again, it becomes, depends on how uh, dominant that gene is for that black fur. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for the call, June. Thank you, June. Okay. We, we, do, good. we do appreciate that, June, very much as we uh, start to put a wrap here on Nature Watch. So, so actually, you know, we, we, Looks like going to be a little cooler here in the next few days. Maybe a lot more comfortable to be outside. Maybe enjoy the outdoors. Oh, to look out through the window yes. from the air-conditioned room, and be, uh, uh, and maybe you'd be able to enjoy that outdoors a lot more. And for those who work out in this weather, we made it. We made it. I work out in the, this weather too. We made it through the yeah. week, my so, friends. So, so, so I'm going to be at Waddell's for a while today yet, and uh, so you might be able to come out and see me feeding the bees. That would be the sweat bees. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> With all this heat, I'm sure the well, I haven't seen many of those flying around yet. I was no. surprised as how as warm as it's been. There's plenty of sweat out there. Uh, yeah, I, I I haven't either. You know, I, oh. and actually, for what it's worth, 
mosquito count has been down for me. Yeah, yeah. so so, so yeah. I think it, despite the rains we've had and the vegetation's wet, we've had a few puddles of water. Yeah, the mosquito count's been down, yeah. which is nice with the heat. Mosquitoes and heat are not fun. Well, and also you mentioned that the soil was still dry. Yeah, so, so water... That, you know, made it into the ground and not puddled everywhere. Of course, mosquitoes have very small wings. It's hard for them to fly in that very humid air, too. So a little very heavy heavy air. So we get a little cooler, we'll probably see some more emerge here. There you go. (laughs) Gary, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you all for your phone calls and listening to this edition of Nature Watch. Tune in each Saturday at 8.30 a.m. for Nature Watch. It's brought to you by Waddell's Nursery, Floral Garden, and Bird Center at the corner of 12th Street and Millam Road. CBS and local news on the way. We'll check weather as well. And then over the garden fence, it's next on 590 and 106.9 FM, WKZO.